Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Bob, and I'm an alcoholic. Sober through the grace of God and A since the 10th of December, 1967, and for that I'm very grateful. Uh, this seems like deja vu. Uh, less than seven days ago, there, I was the least, with at least 20 people in this audience. We were at a retreat together doing the same thing Bob Darrell and I did, so I feel like I've not left. <coughs> I also feel like I don't know. I, those talks were good. The bad news is, is that I'm better on tape than I am in person. <laughs> I, it, uh, so it's, Um, This format, which I think, Bob, actually, years ago we did this format in Whitney, and uh, but Bob popularized it and made it kind of the new genre of AA conferences, and I think it's really been a contribution and a very interesting thing, and I think you get something different out of the people who participate and give the talks. Uh, and you got a great lineup. Lee's did a great job. Thanks for the invitation, and thank you for... I want to introduce you to my lovely wife, Linda. Would you stand, if you would? <laughs> Linda has almost 42 years in al and I have been a constant source of growth for her. <laughs> I don't think she'd have half the program today that she has if it wasn't for... <laughs> For me, and uh, and we have three sons who are in the program. So she's actually a carrier. Uh, I I have uh, kind of like the swine flu thing, you know, that's going around. And I uh, well, none of us were alcoholic when we met her, and uh, you know, so I didn't. I don't know. There's something in it, but the. Uh, but it's been a great ride, and it's, uh, I tell you, it's a partnership uh, that is second to none. It really is uh, uh, really cool. I've enjoyed all the speakers. I'm not going to go through everybody. But to sit down and listen to uh, Tom I. and Sandy Beach, I mean, give me a break. That is about as good as it gets. Um, Two of the men I admire most in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. There are others I'm getting to, I have known for a long time. I've really enjoyed our relationship, especially recently. The bad nun I've known for <laughs> a long time. I was hoping you were going to have pictures. I mean, <laughs> that's why I came. And, uh, I remember meeting you in the early 1970s at the Prince Albert Roundup in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. I don't think we remembered each other from that event, but when you uh, came back to me in Cecil, I went up there. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about steps five, six, and seven. They cover about six pages in the big book. You know, the fifth step seems to be about as, you know, pivotal as any step we have in our program. And, you know, six and seven are on half a page, and five is on about five five or six pages. Uh, I was struck last night, Jerry and Billy and I and Linda have been close friends for a long, long time. We had one of the same mentors. It was Jerry's sponsor in AA, and we've shared an awful lot with each other. But I was struck, and I wasn't sure what he was going to do, and he told a story, and it's an inimical way. Jerry is one of the better storytellers. That It was a talent that all the old-timers had in AA and not as many people have today. I think it's a tradition in the South, and I love that he does that. But because the steps are so spiritual, especially the first three steps, how would you tell someone how to do them? Now, you can describe how you did them. You can put them in a story. You can kind of walk around it and expose it in such a way which I think he did wonderfully well last night. By the time he said, and that's when I took the third step, he just went, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, it just fell into place, and that's what it was. Uh, 
It was terrific. We have, um, I've been sober over 40 years, and I, I, my ego gets going. I get going with all the different pre presenters, and I think I have to go back to my room and study or read or do that. I mean, it, it's just like any of us would be. I mean, it's like all of us are. I mean, it's everything from being competitive to being insecure, but it's what your mind does when you um, get into something like that. And I was struck when Sandy and Tom were talking about the old-timers and Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous. We have more teaching available in Alcoholics Anonymous today than we have ever had. We have more work on the big book, more step workshops, more tapes, everybody on, you know. And uh, I was thinking back to the men and women who, who I got to meet when I came in in the late 60s and the early 70s in Alcoholics Anonymous and the conferences. When they started going to conferences, which... I have the same sponsor that I had when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. He is 89 years old. He is 54 years sober. And Sandy and I have shared that experience. He has also had a original sponsor who died last year. Pretty uncommon to have a, a person who has a lot of sobriety who's, who's lived that long. And uh, he got me active in AA, and we started going to conferences and doing service. And I got exposed, and I started to hear people give the message. And I think because at some point in time I decided, or I didn't decide, but I think I was called, to, you know, this was one of the things I was going to do is, is give AA talks. I paid a lot of attention. I was captivated by the stories that I heard in Alcoholics Anonymous. Very few of the early people that I heard, and most of the early talks were what we would kind of say today were drunk -alogues. They started with the first drink, they ended with their last. They would take five minutes off and at the end of their story and talk about the wife and kids if they were a man or the job and give you kind of a recap, but basically uh, it was their story. But it was told in such a way, it was kind of told how Jerry's story was last night. It was told in such a way, and Jerry's included more recovery, that you, you knew recovery was included. I mean, you experienced it in how the person told their story, how they shared their problems, and you could see that they were standing there pretty much as a, in the solution. Uh, but there was no explicit conversation about how necessarily how that happened. Today there's a lot more explicit conversation about how it happened. I don't think the men or women that I hear talk about the steps in Minnesota, all we had when I came in AA were closed step discussion meetings. That's all we did. 99% of our meetings... Someone would start the meeting, talk about the third step, turn it over. We'd split up into two rooms, and we'd finish the conversation on the third step. That's, I never talked to my group till I was 30 years sober. We had one open meeting a month, and we asked outside speakers. So we didn't have much of that going on. And I don't know exactly what I want to say. What I want to say is they had the spiritual awakening. They had the changes. They were not technical. They were not experts. They were not often people that you would stand up here today and say, we're going to have George present on the steps. But their recoveries were no less profound. Their lives, their lives were no less changed uh, than those of us today that have hundreds of more distinctions about the steps. They did it in a simpler uh, way, but <laughs> they had the result. Uh, and I think sometimes we get too focused on the complexity of what we're sharing and discussing, and I just I, I just wanted to bring that up because I was uh, because I, I guess because I, I got struck by that. Both Sandy and Mildred kind of talked alluded to uh, the true self and the false self, and. Uh, I want to spend just a mo kind of a moment on that because I think that's part of the mischief that we bring. Part of the frustration, I'm thinking that you also do the steps differently when you're at different phases in your sobriety. I think they're a different experience to you, five, six, and seven, that when you come into, when you're brand new in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, you've heard two or three of the people talk this weekend about their first fifth step, that it wasn't very insightful. It didn't get into the causes and conditions. It was really more a recitation of the worst things they have done. I think you would find that to be the most common experience that most of us did if we did our fourth and fifth step quite early in sobriety. That's what mine was. And I wouldn't go back and change it. It just happened to be what it was. It wasn't very insightful, but I'll tell you, it was. I felt forgiveness in it. It was a difficult process for me to go through. It was a 
a powerful process for me to go through. Uh, it takes a while. You don't get it all done. You don't understand the depth. I think a person who's taking uh, the fourth and fifth step at 15 years of sobriety has an opportunity to have a deeper experience than maybe they've ever had before. The most powerful fifth step that I ever took was the one that when Daryl was talking about taking his at uh, four or five years of sobriety through the book, it was my third fifth step, and it was the most powerful fourth and fifth step that I had done. Uh, when I take a look at these steps, what I think first comes to me uh, is I want to, you know, would you like to get and what Bill keeps talking about through the 12 and 12 and through the big book? You know, you want to deal with your defects of character. You want to deal with the things that are in your way. Uh, do you want to get rid of the things that hurt you and damage the people in your lives? And almost all of us would say, yep, sure do want to do that. Well, if we really want to do that, why the hell haven't we done it? I mean, that is, and Bill talks about that's the maybe the you know the biggest conundrum we have in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. If we have the power that we have in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that could expel the power to drink, I mean the the expel drink from our lives and solve the most the largest problem any of us have ever faced in our lives. Why then can't we use that power to get rid of all or most of the other problems that we have in our lives that are causing us mischief? And he goes on to explain that because alcohol threatened our very lives itself, the self-preservation, that it's the only one that we really could do perfectly. And the rest of it is kind of a large effort. We're human beings. We aren't going to get perfect. Uh, but that's but how... How much progress should we make? How much progress do we have to make? I think that, again, depends a little bit on how long you've been sober and what your standards are, what your values are, what your code is, and how you take a look at life. Uh, I think one of the large problems that most of us have relates to something that Mildred was talking about today. I think that many of us have an uh, underdeveloped sense of God and our higher power. For a book, when you read the book, you are just taken with how much they talk about God. I mean, it is just everywhere. It is, it is just time and time again that that's my solution. I don't know if it's just me, and I don't want to project my thoughts on you, but when I think about most of it, I think most of us are looking for tips on how to do it better. That we're looking for, I'm going to go to this seminar, I'm going to hear these people talk about the steps, I'm going to hear, I'm going to, you know, go back to the book or I'm going to read, and we're looking for something that we can learn to be better practitioners of the steps. And when I'm a better practitioner of the steps, obviously I'm going to have a better result. When I have a better result, I'm going to, you know, be a better person, you know, so it's kind of a self improvement program. And, uh, that's an interesting thing because I think one of the things that I just want to talk about before I get into the steps is I think that that is one of the structural things that's wrong. Uh, a couple of people that talked about, you know, and the book keeps talking about, my life would just be fine if you straighten out. That's, you know, one of the early attitudes we have. You know, my problems are external. I'm a victim of circumstances. If the people in my life would straighten up and fly right, get off my back, everything would be okay. All right, and Later, I think what happens is then when we, we go through the work and we start to get in touch with, you know, not only were we alcoholic, but we had other issues that were going on, and we start to tackle some of those issues and they don't go away, we start to see that, you know, we've got a, a host of things that are causing us difficulty, and we start to see that the problems are solved. And then we start, I think, to have an idea, the problem's me. If I shape up, if I change, it will all be okay. And that's been the kind of the dominant idea I've had through much of my sobriety. And it's starting to shift. And what I want to bring up an idea, I think that's me dealing with my old false self. I don't, I think the added idea of improvement or getting me better is an ego based idea. I think it's dealing with my old sense of who I am and what's wrong with me. When Mildred talked about Meister Eckhart and said that the process of finding God is a process of subtraction, not addition, I think, as I said last week, what I think what we do is we come here, we have dragged our perfect magnet through the junkyard of life. 
And I think we show up here as a six-foot ball of scrap metal. Okay. Not bearing much resemblance to the, uh, to the original form, and none of us having much identity with what that, with the essence of our being is. And I think through the process of taking the steps, piece by piece, we pry off the things that are in our way from our connection to our God that we can see within. And maybe after a certain amount of work, all of a sudden there's a little hole and a piercing light comes out of the, the spot. That's the first sense that maybe there's something there that, you know, that isn't there, that, that, we, that, we, that we didn't know. And I think that that is the process. So what we're, where we're going, we're not, you know, another Chuck Chamberlain story. Uh, we started a conference in our state. Chuck was, we asked Chuck there for the first five years. We just... All the men. We have Cecil for the first five years, and Tom for the first five years, and Mac for the first five years. So we had, the, we just loved, it. we just changed their roles and, and did it. There's 8,000 people that attend that conference every year. It's a great conference. <clears throat> but Chamberlain would hold court in his room, and there'd be 30 of us crammed in this hotel room, sitting on the carpet, having Chuck hold court. And I can remember this like as yesterday. I'm right in front of him, and he, we're, we're having the conversation. I'm right there, Matt. The, the fellow I met last week reminds me a little bit of myself with his enthusiasm. And, and Chamberlain looks at me and he says, Son, you're not going anywhere. You already are everything you're ever going to be. And uh, I didn't like that. And uh, <laughs> not only did I not like it, I didn't understand it. Uh, but today I believe that beyond a question of a doubt. I have tried to be a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've tried to do the work over a long period of time, and I think people who know me would say, if you ask them, has Bob changed? They say, oh, heck yes. You know, big difference. Fact is, is I think if you really knew me, you wouldn't say that I've changed. I think you'd say that I've come home. I've become who I have always been. I think you can see in the conversation when you hear Sandy talk or Bob talk or Tom talk, you know, yes, he was that young man that got in all that trouble in that car accident in Michigan, but he always has been the man that we see today. I think that's one of the most powerful things in Alcoholics Anonymous is that we see something in you that you can't see in yourself when you walk in the front door. I think that is one of the most powerful things that happened anywhere in, in our fellowship. So I think that the idea of, ha of improving myself or becoming better, and I think I'm not trying to be semantics, because I think that's a, a fine idea, but I think it's a limiting idea. I think what we are trying to do is find the goodness that has always been there, and that is within. You do not have to become different. You do not have to become anybody else. There is nothing missing. You are coming home. This is going to be a natural process for you when you open your hearts and you start to trust the process. What you're looking for, as Chuck would say, you're looking with. You're looking with the God in you for where you think God is. And I think that is a more comfortable and accessible sense. And I think for my, I, I wouldn't have understood that when it was first said to me, but I believe that with every fiber of my body today. I think that's why you can walk into a jail cell and take a look at a man who has had 12 years of bad road. And you could, if you were a sociologist, you might predict not much opportunity for that man. And then you look at John. Uh, we're not predicting opportunity. We're not limiting what the opportunity is. There's a power in this program that is beyond anything that our minds would linearly. We're not talking about a linear process. We're talking about a process of transformation. And uh, the... Uh, so in the fifth step, which I think most of us think of, of, of a major rite of passage in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, we've come in and we've done the first three steps, and I, I'm going to probably jump all over the place today because I, I, I feel a little scattered, but I'm going to—I'll just do the best I know how to do. Um, I see more people taking steps today without a profound amount of change. I mean, there's just a hell of a lot of work going on. And uh, 
Not always. And, and, and the cynical part of me, I, I want to say it's a hell of a lot easier to do the steps than it is to change. It's a hell of a lot easier doing AA than it is living life. And there are some people that when they memorize the first 164 pages of the big book sound like they're experts on life. And uh, I wouldn't want to go on a fishing trip with some of them. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the book is the menu. It is not the food. Uh, you can starve to death eating the menu. It is when you put it into your life and bring it into action that you have the only access to spiritual that there is, and that's a spiritual experience, not spiritual thought. Uh, not too long ago, I was reading a book on the new Christianity, and I just I don't know why the heck I bought it, but I, it was interesting, and someone recommended it to me, and I bought it. And I don't know if I'll do it justice, but if I was to describe what the difference was, they said that in, in, in kind of the historical way, the mark of whether you were a good Christian is what you believed. Today, so, and, and then if you were a certain kind, the Catholics believed one thing, Methodists believed another, and Baptists, you know, believed some stuff. And they had fine distinctions on the theology of the thing. And if you didn't believe the right thing, you were, you know, and then we had the good guys and the bad guys. And okay, and we're starting to have that in Alcoholics Anonymous, which was not a common factor when I came in. Uh, we didn't have good guys and bad guys. We had people who were desperate and trying to get sober and stay sober and practice the program. And uh, the new Christianity, is what he was saying, is it isn't focused on what you believe. It's focused on how to take the spiritual principles that are in those beliefs and put them into action to transform our lives to have a, a more intimate relationship with the God of our understanding. And I believe that's a big distinction in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I believe, I keep saying I believe, and what I'm trying to say is belief isn't helpful. I mean, having the answer, having, having the answer is, is the booby prize to some extent. Uh, questions sometimes are more powerful than answers. And what I'm saying is, is that I think most of us believe what is in the big book. And that that can get in our way. That we're supposed to do what is in the big book, to have an alteration in how we be. What we're looking for is a transformation, a change in being. And once you change how you be, everything changes. Your behavior changes, how you see things. And uh, we don't have any sense that we don't see things the way we are. It seems like we all have a sense that we see it the way it is. What do you mean I don't see it the way it is? I'm looking right at it. I'm looking right at it. You know. But we don't realize that when we go to look at the world and see how life is, we... There's this big, long fence to look through life, and there's holes in the fence, and we keep going back to our hole. Okay. We've got our chair set up, and we've got our iced tea, and we've, we've got our little carpet. And my hole happened to be right under the cow's tail. And, uh, Once in a while, the cow would move, and I'd have a different view, but most of the time. <laughs> and it doesn't appear. I mean, I went to that place to go take a look at how, how my life is and how life is. But it doesn't occur to me that, first of all, there's other holes in the fence. And that everybody who's looking through the fence isn't having the picture that I'm looking at. And it's a kind of an awakening when you start to get a sense that maybe we have a, a problem of perception. So there's a, a real difference between how we come to the steps. The steps are not mechanical uh, because there's so much teaching about the steps today. And by the way, I think anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. So if you have to wait to do it perfectly, I think that's much too long a wait. I have gone through the steps and I have had not much impact from time to time. <laughs> not every time I go through the steps do I have the level of change and the level of power that I would, uh, powerful experience that I would like to have. We go through step workshops in our area and sometimes I, my experience with them is more perfunctory than it is powerful. 
at other periods of time, I seem to be better plugged in. And they're, so Because if they were mechanical, every time you had a problem, all you have to do is click your heels and say the third step prayer, and you'd be back in Kansas. <laughs> Which, I mean, there really wouldn't be a problem. I mean, if, if that's all you had to do, if there was an issue, you'd just open yourself up and go do that. And I think there's a, and I'm struggling with the same, you know, I've got a half a dozen things that are going on in my life. Uh, <laughs> I've got a very significant business problem that I created for myself. And uh, it's not the first time. You know, I, this, I created a business problem for myself similar to this 10 year, or 15 years ago. I promised myself that would never happen again. <laughs> you know, guess what? It's not funny. I mean, I mean, it's funny, but it's you know, it's not cute. It's not fun. Old and stupid is a bad combination. If you could alter one of those variables, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, and I've got three or four other things that are going on in my life that I'd like to. Ch I say I'd like to change. So. And I haven't been as if I haven't been very effective at changing them. And uh, one of the things that I, th I don't think we also realize when we come into the program and we're about to enter a phase where we expect most of the change to happen in AA uh, is we're conflicted, and we don't understand how seriously conflicted we are. And the fact is, is that part of me very much wants to change, and there's another part of me that very much does not want to change that's afraid of change. And I think that most of us intellectually focus more on the parts of us that want to change. We really don't take very good responsibility for the part, you know, we just don't get in touch with the fact that most of the problems we have in our lives are, are our an previous answers. That, you know, we, we show up in Alcoholics Anonymous or we show up in our middle sobriety with our toolbox. And my toolbox, you know, one time was entirely full of hammers. No wrenches, no screwdrivers, no saws, you know. And when you're only tools a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I mean, it just, you know, it's the only way you have, you know, to kind of approach the, the problem. Uh, so most of us have a profound sense of uniqueness and a profound sense of difference. We come into Alcoholics Anonymous, we're literally forced in by the conditions in our lives, and we have a surrender experience, and we, which is not a small deal. And in that surrender experience, it's pretty hard to describe because it's a spiritual experience, I think what happens is our egos get suppressed. And when our egos get suppressed and pushed down, our sense of difference dissipates and, and starts to go away, and we have a sense of there's an opening, there's a teachability, there's a space that is, you know, hasn't been there for a long time. Our defenses are down and we're, we're vulnerable. And many of us talk about the honeymoon in Alcoholics Anonymous. My honeymoon experience was that. I came in, I was in an, you know, enough trouble to get me to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a surrender, I had a wall built up around me that you couldn't see. The thinking that when I'm behind the wall said you like me, but you only like what I let you see about me. If you could see everything about me, you'd hate me because I hate me, and who knows more what a crummy person I am than me. And then I, but I started to tear that wall down when I called Alcoholics Anonymous. Two guys came out and talked to me, and then I continued that conversation with my sponsor, and I tore the wall all the way down in my fist step, and I made a discovery. The discovery was, is I'm not unique. My personality may be unique, but not my illness, not my behavior, not my feelings, not my experience, and I started to have a sense of hope that would work for you could work for me. My experience is that most of us build that wall back up sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. That we start, you know, we make enormous progress in the first couple of years in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, it would be very hard, you know, if you grafted it, it would be like a mountain. I mean, we come in here with very serious problems, and all of a sudden you see drastic personality changes, and you see a willingness that you've never seen in a person and all of a sudden the person who had difficulty doing certain things is volunteering to do stuff and it's just it's really you know a remarkable change when you start to see someone really grasp a hold of of recovery and then i think many of us flatten out 
And during that period of time where we flatten out a little bit, where we're no longer the center of attention, we're not the new person, you know, where our recovery becomes more daily, we start to get in touch and experience a different set of problems, not the crisis that were in front of us with the police and with our finances and with not having an automobile and maybe not having a job and, you know, all the sorts of really, I mean, you know, all these things that we really had to deal with just to kind of get our life, just to get the noise out of our lives, to be able to attend to the business of living life, we used to, we start to deal with those things. And those are big changes. And a lot of them, you know, it takes a while and they aren't easy to do. But once those, that starts to settle down, you start to find out that there's another set of issues and problems that are in your life that have stopped you from keeping jobs. You can get a job, but you can't have a career. You can have a, a relationship, but you can't maintain a marriage. You know, you've got issues with kids, and, you, you know, you're not happy with what ever experience. I mean, it's really complicated. You ask alcoholics normal questions, you know, <laughs> do you work? Um, <laughs> there's this long pause, you know. <laughs> Are you married? Uh, you know, that's a... And it isn't, it isn't like we don't know how to answer the question. We just don't know how much time you have. I mean, it, it is... Uh, uh, you know. So we show up with a level of difficulty and complexity in our lives that most people have not experienced, and it, you know, it's a. Uh, uh, but once we start to ha- experience, I think, kind of the 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 issues that were there all the time, that were some of the causes and conditions of our alcoholism, but because they weren't in crisis, they weren't the IRS, they weren't the police, they weren't the divorce, they weren't the lost job, they were what brought us to those positions, and we're dealing with the symptoms, which is what I think most of us, which is what our first inventory did, which was our first attention was, was on those, the largest problems that we thought we had in our lives. We didn't really realize much as we were talking about alcoholism, I think we got a sense when we started to go through it, that they weren't the problems, they were the symptoms, they were the results didn't occur to us. They sure as heck looked like problems. And for most of us, that's what we really thought we had to focus on and what we have to deal with. And once we start to get to the second level of stuff, all of a sudden we're sober a couple of years. And, you know, it's I'm not sure that I'm ready to deal with it. Thank you very much for helping my drinking problem, but stay out of my sex life. <laughs> Thank you very much for helping my drinking problem, but stay out of my marriage. Stay out of my finances. Stay out of my job. Stay out of my parenting. Stay out of my anger. Stay out of my gambling. Brick by brick, many of us build the damn wall back up. It's sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And you find ourselves somewhat isolated, feeling like we're different, not feeling like we're not understood. Four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten and twelve years of sobriety. And that, I think, is what, you know, I, the way I was able to attack those, thank God, was, you know, by getting back into the work and going back into the steps and doing more inventory work. And it wasn't until I got into my third fourth and fifth step that uh, I really got my hands on the dials that started to give me a sense of of uh, where my life was going. My life, probably not just similar to many people in this room, I was a great starter and I was a poor finisher. You know, I never finished anything. I could get into school, I couldn't finish school. I could get the job, I couldn't do the job. And it just, it gets old, you know, and... Uh, Lots of potential, but no, you know, no performance, not much stuck to the wall. So when we start to be in Alcoholics Anonymous and we make a big start and we really make some progress in Alcoholics Anonymous and then it flattens back out and it looks like we're not making progress, that's a pretty familiar experience for us. And we, you know, many of us take a look at this and said, yep, this is kind of how it all goes, you know. <laughs> I just, you know, here I am, and now AA, I've got a many problems with five years of sobriety as I damn near had when I came in, you know, sobriety, and this is just one more place where I haven't done very well, and I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. And I think the pain of that experience uh, forced me, you know, to get back in to do another inventory. And while i doing some of this early talking in the deal, I think we have to be careful about what we bring to the steps. Because they are not mechanical, because they're spiritual actions, because they are of God, we can't just tell some. It isn't just, 
tell someone what to do. It isn't just about doing. There's a way that we have to bring ourselves into this process. There's a type of honesty. There's a type of open-mindedness. There's a type of humility. There's a type of being in that process that a way we have to be, I think, to get the full measure of what the steps have to offer us. Now, you know, so that's kind of why I'm having that conversation. And I, because I think that most of us who have been around for a while, when we go back to step four and five, and some of us, when we go back to four and five, we don't bother doing one, two, and three. We've got one, two, and three. We want more information. Well, most of us, I mean, give me a break. Is there anybody in the room that needs more information about their defects of character? <laughs> I mean, it isn't, you know. Uh, so let me finish this one. There's two things that I think that are very significantly, three things that I think are very significantly in a way. Number one, how we see God. And I think that most of us are pretty lazy when it comes to that. I don't think we do much spiritual reading, and I don't think we, you know, when we get into the conversation, we understand how important it is, but then we go back to our lives and we, you know, we say, yeah, we were alcoholic and couldn't manage our own lives. No human power could manage it, but God couldn't would if we were sought. But we don't spend much specific time seeking God. We're lazy. We don't read much. And, you know, every once in a while it would be a pretty good idea for us to take a look and ask ourselves what, for me, that idea, what does seeking God mean for me? Because it, it, it might promote a different result than I've been having. Number two is how afraid of change we are. Uh, I jokingly say, with a fourth and fifth step, pretend I'm working with a guy who's 40 years old, married with kids, and he's having trouble doing the fourth step. And I say, don't worry about it. It's kind of complicated. You know, it's got all those columns and stuff. Just, and I know you're struggling with it. Just uh, get your ex-wife and get your wife and get your boss, get your mom and dad and one of your brothers and uh, your children and bring them over to the house. And here's what I want you to say to them. Just say, we have a step in Alcoholics Anonymous where we try to get in touch with our defects of character, and I'm having trouble identifying mine. <laughs> You'd have a pretty good start. <laughs> but most of us wouldn't call that meeting. Because uh, we didn't want to change. Number one. Not only do we not want to change, we don't want to know. We train the people in our lives what they can say to us and what they can't say to us. You know, we're not talking about that. You say to your wife, we're not, you want to have that conversation? Going to be a tough conversation. You train your boss. Your boss knows what you can say to you and what he can't say to you. Your sponsor knows what you're open to and what you're not open to. Your children know. Everybody knows except you. You get to a point, you know, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous for the first number of years, I tried to change and I failed, I tried and failed, I tried and failed, but I still grew. There comes a time where you've either where you get to a point where if you don't change, you stop growing. And at that point, you either pick a different group of friends that you make a deal, I won't call you on your crap, you don't call me on mine. And you start to build an addition onto the house to deal with the problem. Or you take another whack at this thing and, and get it at a different level and try to get your hands on the causes and conditions and the power that is really in these steps. We are afraid of change, mostly because we hit, most of the issues we are dealing with are old issues. They are not new. They are not months new. They are not, you know, years, you know, they've, many of us are dealing with some of the same issues, defects of character that we've had for years and years, and we tend to think it's who we are. It's not who you are. It's just behavior. You can change your political party and it doesn't change who you are. You can change your behavior and it doesn't change who you are. But most of us so identify with some of these defects of character that we've had for so long. We think it's our personality. We think it's who we are. And we literally are not, you know, unsure. And we kind of set up a, a wall that we're not, you know, not only do we are somewhat unwilling, we don't think we're able to deal with it. And... uh and then when we come to the steps, as I say, I, I, I think you need a relationship and a trust with your God or your understanding that is beyond what 
I have had at different periods of time in my life. I really think that my sense of what God wants for me is going to be, I'm going to make less money, it's going to be less exciting, it won't be as much fun. It'll be, you know, I just often when I have that sense that, you know, God is, you know, external and has a set of standards or rules that he's going to apply to my life that, you know, if I apply them, I'm, you know, it'll be better. I'm sure everybody will think it's just fine, but it's, I'm not going to like it. And uh, as much, as, you know, I'm, and I really think we have a resistance to turning our will and lives over to the care of God. And I think what we bring to the process many times when we are doing four and five is we bring our intellect. We don't bring our heart, what Mildred was talking about. And that's the toughest foot and a half that any of us ever have to get from your head to your heart. If all you're bringing to the process is information in your head, your intellect and your ego, you've got, you know, you've got a 16-year-old running your life, and that's bringing a knife to a gunfight. You are not, you know, bringing just your intellect, just your information, looking for another idea is what got you in the place that you are in. And I'm struck that when we get into chapter 6, one of the very first, there's three or four places that when Bill talks in the book, and I'm g- going to read one of them in a second, but on page 72, when, he, when we're starting about getting into the step 5, <clears throat> he said, you know, by now we've done our fourth step, we've admitted certain defects of character, we've ascertained in a rough sense what the trouble is, we put our finger on our weak items of personal inventory, now these are about to be cast out. How many people how many of us go to the process of step four and five thinking that our defects of character are going to be cast out? I think I approached it so many times as I'm going to learn something new, and then I'm going to have to do some work. And as a result of doing the work, I'm going to improve or get better, and something's going to change. But I think most of us have a sense that we're going to do it. We're going to ident- we know what we're identifying. We know what's going to happen. And this is not a small idea, and I, it's, it's so big that it's really hard to kind of get your hands around, but I want you to know that I think that this is how change happens in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. On the bottom of page 84 and the top of page 85 is my favorite paragraph and a half in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it says, We have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. We are sel- seldom interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as if from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally. We find that this has happened automatically. Does that sound like I'm doing it? We will see that our new attitude towards liquor has been given to us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes as the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We've not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor afraid. This is how we react as long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. So in addition to us doing the work, and it is doing the work, in addition to us taking the steps, in addition to us studying the book, I also want to say that I think we have to put ourselves in a position to receive a gift. I think we have to put ourselves into a position to be a receiver and a channel of a power that is so much greater, because I think that that's the experience that most of us had in in having drink removed from our lives. I think if we would have that we tried the approach that that I sometimes try on my defect of character now to get more information, get a better diet program. Maybe I'll get one of those things where they send meals into the house, or you know, I mean, this is you know an eight-year-old program that <clears throat> what am I going to do when I'm on these weekends when I go, you know. I mean, when I'm managing it, I don't get very far with what I'm doing. And I'm half serious about it, but it's more at the level of complaint than it is at the level of a serious piece of business. And I think that's the other thing that most of us, when Tom talked about <coughs> uh, this morning when he said, or uh, yesterday, after, I forget when the heck it was, when he and Sandy were, were doing the deal when they asked the man if he wanted to get well. Most of us don't want to get well. We want relief. I don't want to cure. <laughs> I'm in a vat of liquid manure up to my nose. And someone's reaching out and said, can I help you out? And said, nope, 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 okay, just get that guy over there to stop making waves. <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> we're, you know, it's, uh, 
you know. It is. We want relief from the symptom. We do not want a cure. A cure, in order to get a cure, there has to be a surrender. Your ego has to get out of the way. We are not going to put ourselves to that level of vulnerability. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I was standing someplace, and someone asked him what his favorite type of meeting was. And he said, I like it, he said, when a new person gives his first talk. So there's something really powerful about when a person communicates themselves. And I think in the very fullest sense, and I, I think that was a marvelous observation, I think in a very f sincere sense that that is what happens at a, at a deep, deep level when we do step four and, and step five. That we, that this sense of difference, this sense of uniqueness, this wall that we have built up, the sense that I'm different, that there's something wrong with me, that there's something dirty about me or broken about me. Something has to get at that in a way that is so significant that if it doesn't get at that, we're, 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 we're not going to remove one of the major blocks. And <clears throat> I think step five, after we've taken step four, when you sit down with another person and bury your soul and tell your story and go through your inventory and talk about the things that you you know, that you don't feel very good about. Uh, in the 12 and 12, it talks about that, you know, many people get drunk if they don't take this step. And why? And it says because they've not really cleaned house. And it talks about they've not cleaned house so that God can enter and expel the defects of character. And I keep bringing back to it because I'm, tell I'm telling you, when I study this and I get into it, I have a tendency to think I'm going to do it. I have a tendency, someone says, are you power, you know, am I powerless? I'm not, because what I'm going to start to rely on is what I know. I've been around here 40 years. I know, you know, I can, but I'm still powerless. It's still alcoholism. The physical symptom is gone, but the mental and emotional symptoms are still there. And they cause significant trouble in my life. And I'm, in many, in a, in a similar way, I'm just as powerless over those defects of character as I am over my drinking, and the, and the answer to them is the same surrender and openness and vulnerability that I was forced into with my drinking. But most of us, you know, when it talks about that, we just, you know, kind of want, uh, you know, we just want improvement. We just want enough improvement to get by. Just want enough improvement for it to be okay. And, you know, in many cases, that's not enough to sustain us in our, in our recovery. And it's not enough to deal with the issues that are going on in our lives. And I think when you talk about the full measure, when you listen to Mildred talk about it, you know, 36 years, that for the last four or five years, she's been going through a series of changes. I likewise have been going through a series of changes. And, uh, I'm not a, you know, I'm not dealing with issues that I had 10 and 15 years ago. I'm dealing with issues that I have in my life today that I'm trying to deal with to improve my, you know, spiritual condition. I'm dealing with a set of circumstances that are not horribly different than when I went broke in the late 80s. Uh, they're a little different and they aren't as severe, but they're serious. And this time, I am not giving up my soul. It's got my attention. I am afraid. There are issues that I do not want to be dealing with, but I do not let myself go into the cave. I do not let myself become obsessed by it. As soon as that conversation starts, I distract myself from that conversation. I'll read something. I'll call someone. I'll go to a meeting. You know, I'm going to five, six meetings a week. And I just do that because it starts my day right. You know, it just it just reminds me of who I am. I know more about who I am when I'm at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous than any other place in my life. Uh, so the two things that the promises, both in the 12 and 12 and in the book book, talk about when we sit down with another person, we have that long conversation and we illuminate all the dark crevices of our lives. The two main promises are that we lose our sense of separateness. And the other promise is, is that up till now we've had certain beliefs, spiritual beliefs, but now we start to have a spiritual experience. That Bob talked about the difference between knowing there's policemen out there and having the light in your review mirror. There is something about the profundity of the experience that I'm going to have when I sit down with another human being. And again, you know, and obviously it talks about how just going through that process alone is not, you know, sufficient. We fooled ourselves 
we really do need to have someone. And I think it was interesting. I was thinking of Paul Martin, who Jerry's close to, and I, uh, old time guy in Chicago, and uh, he's a he has kind of a I don't know if I'd say unusual practice, but it is a practice that isn't widely held. And they swap fist steps. If you went up there and you had some issues that were going on in your life and you were going to do a fist step, you'd go up there and there'd be five or six of you that would trade fist steps. And uh, and our book talks about until you sat down and had that conversation with another person and heard someone else give it to you, okay, you haven't had the full experience. And I think it's based on that that, that it is... Um, uh, in the 12 and 12, it says, until we have talked with a complete candor about our conflicts and had listened to someone else do the same thing, uh, we still didn't belong. There is something in that exchange that is a powerful sort of thing, and I think most of us who are here two steps would attest to that. And then we get into step six. <clears throat> the book tells us to go home and go to a quiet place and review the first five action, first five steps and take a look and see how we built the foundation because that's going to be the... Uh, the arch through with we pass through and it's going to be the foundation for the rest of our travels in Alcoholics Anonymous. And one other thing I want to say about the foundation, uh, I think when I read the book, I'm struck with how differently they take a look in some ways at step three. I tend often not to think of step three as an action step and he talks about it as an action step. He talks about, you know, if you've got a new guy you're working with and he wants to come over to your house either to make a decision or to tell the story. And I think they talked about making a decision as something that was more concrete than I do. That that they really saw that as a significant, you know, sort of thing. So many of us when we say the third step for for the first time, and I think that many of us when we go back, if we're looking for a real change in five and six and seven, that's one of the things I think that we might go back and take a look at is how important we think the decision is, because I think the decision is is more important than we sometimes do. So when we get to step six, Bill talks, now here's a, you know, six and seven in the big book are, you know, seven lines, eight lines long. And then when we get to the 12 and 12, Bill's talking about it, just that the sixth step is the step that separates the men from the boys and Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and then at the bottom of the the first page, he talks about having been granted a perfect release from alcoholism, then why shouldn't we achieve the same thing, a perfect release from every other difficulty or, or defect? This is the riddle of our existence, the full answer to which may be only in the mind of God. Nevertheless, at least part of the answer is apparent to us, and he goes on and talks about self-preservation, that alcohol was killing us and we had to deal with it and that we're more likely to deal with it perfectly because abstinence is the only way to deal with it. The other defects of character are often not threatening our lives. They just ruin our marriages and children and jobs and relationships. They don't have, they don't kill us. Um, and it talks about getting entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. And again, I say that I think for me, one of the a couple of things that I've got to get into is one is I want to have an understanding of the process. Number two, I want to understand that I have committed, that I also have part of me that's conflicted and I don't want to change. And um, one of the paragraphs I like the best, and it says, he says, we want to settle only for as much perfection as can get us by in life according to, of course, our various sundry ideas of what gets us by. So the difference between the men and the boys in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is striving for a self-determined objective or a perfect objective, which is God. And again, I think when you throw that through your mind, I think most of us would be scared to death to fully open ourselves up to have God be the directors of our lives. That's the ego. Why do you have presenters that average 60-some years of age presenting on the program. Well, I think one of the reasons you do is most of us are old enough in life to know that most of the things we've been chasing most of our lives weren't worth chasing. <laughs> what is a midlife crisis? A midlife crisis is that someone sets a goal, you know, when you get to realize that you're 50 years old 
and you aren't going to climb all the mountains that you wanted to climb in your life, and that the mountains you have climbed haven't made the difference that you thought they were when you went to climb them. And in some ways, for some people, that is a such a major depressive thought that they almost can't deal with it. And I think that when you're on a spiritual walk, when you face that the, that conclusion, it makes sense. Is that most of the things, you know, the ego part of us is chasing stuff. Most of us think we, you know, we are what we have. You know, we're our car, we're our house, we're our watch, we're our bodies, we're our, you know, our 401ks, we're, you know, we're, you know, I mean, it's our, we're our net worth, we're whatever, you know, but the answer is out there. One of the biggest differences I think today that I, you know, Sandy and Tom were talking about why are there more relapses today. One of the biggest differences that I see in, the, in 2009 compared to when I came in in 1967 is we, we sometimes forget where, what society has gone. Society has moved significantly. I think society supported recovery in the 50s and 60s and 70s and maybe even up to the 80s. Today, I think the general thinking of society is addictive. I think it supports illness, not recovery. I think it supports the idea that if you're, are you having trouble, you shouldn't have any trouble. We'll get you a medication you, or, or, a, or, a, or a credit card, you know, I mean, and, and we'll get it for you right now. You know, you, sh you shouldn't have to wait. I mean, if you're really in pain, something's wrong. You shouldn't be in pain. I remember my grandma's a husband died when she was 42 years old. That I've never heard that woman. I didn't get along with her very well, and I was a real pain in the neck to my grandmother. And she was an ordinary and extraordinary woman. She lived with her sister, who also lost her husband. I never heard those two women complain ever, except about me. They, I mean, no, I, she did, I mean, she would complain because I was a. She helped mother. We, we I was one of seven kids, and I was. Oh God, I was a pain in the ass. Uh, but when you went to those women, it wasn't like they were shocked that things were difficult. And I think today, one of the things when we talk about humility, I think one of the things today is most of us are just shocked that something bad's happened to us. We don't think, I mean, we don't think there should be any difficulty in life. We've been running from difficulty all our life, and we want to avoid it. And I think one of the great dif differences that I see in some of the guys that I work with is when they take a look at at stopping drinking or stopping using drugs, they think they're giving something up. They think they're giving something up, and they're not sure they want to give it up. I think that most of the drunks that came in earlier in Alcoholics Anonymous had a fairly long drinking history, got the crap beaten out of them, at a and they had a sense that they were being freed from prison, that they were being given an answer, that they were being let out of jail. And today, these younger people, because of their sense of entitlement, they feel they're being restricted. And there's a real, there's more of a resistance in that kind of thinking, and I think that's reflective of society. That's my right. It's my entitlement. No one should tell me what to do, even if it's my conscience. You know, <laughs> hello. Um, you know, but I do. I mean, I, I really do think that there's a sense that they're giving something up. And, and, it, and it, it's hard for them, and, and I think they've got to find an, they're, they're so detached, their time frame for looking at life is like three days long. <laughs> you know, they're all bricklayers. There isn't anybody building a church. I mean, they just have absolutely no sense of the bigger picture. I mean, you talk to someone about, look, we're building a boat. It's going to take you a couple of years to build the boat. It's going to take you on the journey for the rest of your lives. They don't want to do that. They want to strap a couple of logs together, throw them in the goddamn river, and get going. <laughs> but no, they absolutely do not, you know, I know what you old guys had to do, but it, it is. Uh, when I got back, the last couple of years, when, I, when I've gotten back into reading, you know, in 6 and 7, uh, and I want to talk about, uh, Lee, I've been talking about an hour. I've got 15 minutes, okay? Uh, I had five or six issues that were going on in my life that had to do with money. It had to do with my marriage. It had to do with my sometimes, 
anger and violence with my children that was two or three generations old in my family. It had to do with how I spent money. Uh, it had to do with life. I was a poor worker. I had trouble going to work. I had trouble staying at work. And I had a little trouble working at work. And, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, like none of you have ever had that problem. I don't. I don't uh, and I had a gambling problem. Uh, hobby, kind of. Uh, <laughs> Four or five hours a day, four or five days a week. It wasn't a big deal. But I was making five to ten grand a year playing backgammon, and it was kind of like a second job. I found myself at eight years of sobriety, seven and a half years of sobriety, ready to walk, not walk out of alcoholics time, but I was thinking about killing myself. I wasn't thinking about drinking. I came to AA because I was so tired and disgusted with me. I, I didn't know fully if I was an alcoholic. I was 23 years old. I had been diagnosed with an alcoholic when I was 19. I knew I had a drinking problem, but I tried sobriety. Abstinence did not seem to be my problem. My life didn't clear up. I thought everybody was telling me I had a bourbon drinking problem, stop drinking bourbon, and I thought, no, it's deeper than that. You don't get it. Uh, and now I'm seven years sober. I have uh, sponsees are making more progress than I'm making. Uh, I'm in as much pain, I'm in as much debt at seven years of sobriety as I was when I came in AA. I paid all the debt of the first time, and now I'm back up to where I was before. Uh, all my friends know how to work. I don't, I seem to be the only guy I know that doesn't know how to work. I mean, it's just a joke. I mean, I don't know how to work. I'm, you know, my father was a very successful guy and uh, had lots of good examples. My friends knew how to work, and I didn't know how to work. And uh, I uh, had a second surrender at, 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 at that time in my sobriety. I was forced into I was in a lot of pain. And I, the problem is, is I know if I went to God and I asked God what I was supposed to do, which is what we all want to know, you get an interview with God. <laughs> God is Bob. What do you want? <laughs> I'm eight years sober. My pants are on fire. I need help. <laughs> um, and then you ask God what you're supposed to do. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what God's going to ask me to do with my defective character. You know, get on a budget. Stop gambling. Go to work. Stay at work. Work at work. <laughs> be kind and loving to your children, you know, and your wife. Uh, stop spending more money than you make. And... Uh, I know that's what he's going to ask me to do, and I can't. I, what the hell do you think I've been trying to do for the last seven years? As soon as I clean my act up, I can go to God. But until I really clean my act up, you know, I can't fulfill the conditions of the relationship. Why? How do I deepen the relationship? That's like going to a man who's really serious about AA and asking him to be your sponsor. And you go to ask him to be your sponsor because you know he's really going to be more serious about getting you involved in the work. And you know you can't do the work, <laughs> or you know you think you can't do the work, or whatever the hell you know it would be. And, and so you, you kind of like to ask him to be your sponsor, but you're not sure you can do it. And out of desperation, I went back to the steps, and I took step one and identified easily that I was powerless and unmanageable at eight years of sobriety. I took the one that changed my life was step two. Uh, I had lost step two. I believed it for us, but not for me because my life was going backwards, and uh, I had to regain the second step. And I, by watching you deal with problems more effectively than I was dealing with smiles on your faces with a courage that I didn't have, I, started, I came to believe that God would restore me to sanity at eight years of sobriety. I took step three on my knees with my sponsor in his office. We didn't do that much in those days, and I thought, this time, baby, I'm crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And I did my third fourth step in the book. Um, and then I did my third fifth step with my sponsor, and the previous two have been with clergy. And uh, I told him, I said, be careful when you're done, because I'm going to do whatever you recommend that I do. I said, I am. I feel like I'm dying of thirst lying next to a lake. I said, I could give a talk on what to do with a person in my condition, and I can't do it. I, got, I know all the answers, and I can't do it. And I am so sick and tired of having the answer and not being able to do it. Uh, so I got into it. One of the things he wanted me to do was go to a clinical psychologist. I didn't want to do it. I did. I had issues about work, money, 
failure, and success. And he said, you know, Bob, I want you to go talk to someone. I did. I thought that made, separated me, made me different. I didn't want to do it, but I did it. And what I discovered, because I only got a couple of minutes, I'm not going to set it up like I usually do. What I discovered in the meeting with the psychologist was fear. And I've done three inventories. My fear inventory had to do with dogs, snakes, and tall buildings. I had, I had zero sense. I, I didn't do it properly. I, I was afraid of being a husband. I was afraid of the responsibility. We had three children, or two at that time. Uh, I was afraid of being a father. Uh, I, I remember when Linda told me she was pregnant. I mean, I'm making $525 a month. She's making $550 a month, and I'm seeing half my income go. I'm not jumping up and down that we're going to have a baby. I am scared witless that, <laughs> you know. And I want to say another thing about that, because it kind of gets into making amends, too. The universe provides when it's time. It doesn't always let you know ahead of time how it's going to happen. And uh, so I just I was swimming in fear and did not know it. I was the fish in the ocean and didn't know what the ocean was. And uh, I went home after not too long after that deal with the psychologist and uh, I had a horrible day. And I uh, was in my living room reading some non-conference approved literature. And uh, the Bible, to be more specific, I am, I am in bad shape. This is not. I'm in. And I realized that I had tried as hard as I knew how to try to clean my act up, and I had failed. And for some reason, that seemed okay. Would not have been okay any other time. And I, I was given the opportunity to take the six and the seven step of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Six steps said that we're entirely ready to have God remove our defects of character. I had been spending time busting my britches working on them, and that we humbly ask and remove our shortcomings. I am the pipe, not the well. It happens through me, not by me. I am responsible, but I am not the power in the process. I think I am going to change by muscle and information. That night I got down on my knees. I took the sixth and the seventh step. It's the last time I gambled. All of a sudden, the guy <coughs> who didn't know how to work made appointments with a sponsor about when I'd go to work, how long I'd stay at work, and what I'd do at work. I turned the checkbook over to my wife, who does not have the big shot issues with money that I have. She still manages, she still gets my salary. And I went on an allowance. Uh, I started dating my wife every Friday night. I dated her every Friday night for 30 some years we don't do that anymore, but we have lots. Of, well, we have lots. We have, we're together more, and we have lots. But it was, sometimes we miss it. It's a. It was a real live, dangerous date. I had to learn how to be romantic. We, we were talking about kids and bills when we were going out, and we had to learn how to shack up again and have fun, and you know, get in a, you know, get romantic. And uh, I spent thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours trying to learn how to be a better parent. I think having children is like having a bowling alley installed in your head. I think it's one of the most <laughs> most demanding. I think it's one of the most demanding processes in the world. One of the great privileges of life. But I'll tell you, the manual the manual's skinny. And uh, <clears throat> but. And all of a sudden, the guy that didn't know how to work was blessed also with the luck of uh, sometimes being at the right place at the right time, with also with the luck of being in the real estate investment business at a positive time. In the next 10 or 15 years, I made enough money to burn a wet elephant. And um, it, was, uh, it was the most dramatic experience. And then I went on and did a, another set of amends. You know, cleaned up a number of things that I that I hadn't totally covered in my first step. A farmer doesn't grow; he plants a seed and creates a fertile environment in which growth can take place, and God grows. A doctor doesn't heal; he creates an aseptic environment, creates an atmosphere in which healing can take place, and God heals. I don't change. I create an atmosphere in which change can take place, and God changes me. I think for most of us, if we were honest with ourselves, 
it's almost, when, we, when, the, when it says on page 84 or 85 that the problem has been removed. I am not resisting it. I am not fighting it. It's just, it's automatic. It doesn't, it is not a temptation. It is, fa- what has happened to us, how does our book say we've changed? Having had a spiritual awakening. Well, what's an awakening? Your, your consciousness increases. When your consciousness increases, you start to see it. When did we start to deal with our alcoholism? When we saw it. Everybody else saw it. Didn't help until we saw it. See it or be it. When you don't see it, you are it. So the angry guy who doesn't even know he's angry, doesn't see it. (laughs) His wife sees it. His children sees it. His boss sees it. His sponsor sees it. He doesn't see it, so he is it. So the first stage of the change is tell the truth. Name it. I had to name myself as an abusive father to my children. I I can't tell you how third generation, you know, heavy spankers slap the kids once in a while. I mean, just stupid, horrible stuff. We have three children in recovery. 21 years sober, 18 years sober, and 11 years sober. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, could you get more blessed than that? How would it have been if those kids had the disease but wouldn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous because of the jerk who was their dad? How would that have been? Would that have been a great thing for Alcoholics Anonymous? Gives a hell of an AA talk. <laughs> you know. We're flawed people. It is, I mean, you know, it's a. But there's a power that is available to us. Uh, I think most of us are afraid of the power. I think most of us bring our egos to the process of the steps and don't realize that we're bringing the problem to the solution, that we're looking for information, ideas, and we're trying to improve something that doesn't need improvement. You're not missing anything. You're going home. You're getting rid of what is in your way. When your consciousness improves and increases, You will see through the treasure. It is not gold. It is a dog turd in gold (laughs) tinfoil. And when you really start to see it, I mean, you get it. I mean, you start to, I thought my gambling, I thought I was just the best. I made five to ten grand a year playing. It was a turd wrapped in in gold tinfoil. It was what was stopping me from being a responsible man and a decent worker. And, you know, it was one of my little treasures that I hung on to. And when I let go of it, it, not only did I have the absence of the problem, I have what every one of us experience when we go through the process of opening ourselves up to our higher power and letting go, you end up with benefits so far beyond the absence of the problem that you can't even imagine it. So I think that we are the pipe, not the well. I think the process of change happens much more by the grace of God than it happens by our intellect and by our will and by our muscle. We need our will. We need nothing wrong with intelligence, but it isn't enough. It isn't powerful enough. And by the way, you're never going to get rid of the ego. As Mildred talks about, it's your space suit. Okay? There's nothing wrong. It isn't that the ego is bad. It's just unconscious. And that's the choice we have. Chuck talked about you can have a God-centered life and suffer the consequence, or you can have a self-centered life and suffer the consequence. The experience for me when I have a God-centered life, when I'm in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not as important as I am when I'm self-centered. What is happening around me is not as important as it is when I am in Alcoholics Anonymous. There is a wisdom and a sense and a peace and a joy that is available to me in this process that I have never found any place else. Thank you for my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.